like I watched teams on the power plan, like I said, just just case in point, like was at a game with Seattle and Dallas in game three recently. And and I'm watching Dallas and like uh, uh, Miro Heskinen goes down in the second period. So that changes things up in their power play. But yeah. I'm watching it and I'm like, man, like there's so many different looks. Like sometimes they're doing these up high rotations and then other times, and I'm thinking about it like in your role, like how do you evaluate tape and say, okay, what's a – a fugazi and what's actually something that we can show that has some substance to it that might actually that we're pretty sure is going to show up like how, how do you kind of see through the smoke and mirrors because there seems like there's a lot yeah I, you know what i when you do when you're pre-scouting a team you do see tendencies yeah so i think a lot of teams now they give their players freedom to to make plays as they see fit um but they all do have structure that they're they base off of. So when a certain player is on one side of the ice, he's a one-time threat, or if he doesn't have a one-timer, he's looking for a shot pass to the backside. So you make your players aware on that side of the ice, this is what they're looking to do for the most part with this unit, like a Pasternak in, in Boston, for example. Yeah, um, They know who the one-time threats are, so they can mentally prepare themselves for, okay, this is my responsibility when he's out here. On the other side of the ice, um, this is what they typically look to do. But I think for us, is you know, when we're when we're working on our penalty killing, we hit the habits more so than anything, and we continually go back to them and back to them and back to them and back to them with repetition, so they understand how their stick should be or how fast we want them to move side to side. All those things really matter. So we give them a little bit of an idea of what they're going to expect. So our pre-scout meetings are like eight to twelve clips. That I would show on power play and I have lines drawn on them and all that stuff um, but a lot of it is is making sure that we're good in the habitual areas of the penalty kill like getting under sticks making sure that we pressure together um, trying to steer them into a certain spot on the ice so we feel like we can outnumber them those are the things that really matter for us and then it's as I mentioned earlier making sure they're prepared for what they're likely to see um, but if you really focus on the habits I, I think they're able to react accordingly too. So you want your your power plays to play with a little bit of freedom. You have to trust your penalty killers to make good reads as well. So if you give them the information beforehand, um, trust the repetition of you, as you've built your, your penalty kill over the year and over the season as it's moved along. Um, and then you trust your players. Let them go out there and do the job and, and get it done for you. One of the most common questions we get at the coach's site is if we have any advice on how to practice the penalty kill and i think particularly with coaches at levels where they might only have two to three practices a week and you know time's limited it's it's literally like it's the equivalent of like pulling out um it's like algebra in school like no kid gets excited about doing the algebra part of the day and that kind of feels what the penalty kill can be like and i think a lot of that is just you know the kind of default way of practicing it is to bring four players on the ice have them kind of be the the dummies for the power play unit and they kind of know what's going on. And it just seems like there's not really a, um, a practical way of, of, of working on those skills, but you just mentioned a bunch of habits, like getting under sticks, taking away lanes, et cetera. How would you recommend, maybe not even so much for you know what you're doing with the flames, but just for any coaches looking for advice on how to practice the PK, like where would you start in any, as best as you can verbally, maybe any drills that might be helpful. Yeah, it's that's a tough one too. Because even at our level, like you think about wanting to work on the penalty kill while you're working on the power play. Well, some of your penalty killers are power play guys, like we've already talked about. So you don't yeah. really have your your first full personnel. What what you can do uh, if you want to work on your power play penalty kill is make it about the penalty kill. So put the guys that maybe typically aren't on a power play. Um, mm on the power play and have your guys actually kill together and their pairs or partners. And that gives you a little bit of an opportunity to have them work together and start to be able to read off one another. Yes, your power play might not be as strong and as much of a challenge for good penalty killers, um, but it puts them together. And that's the first start. Uh, From there, I think you can break it down. And I learned a lesson this year. Like there's a lot of teams that with this, with the, you know, the way power plays are using some low plays now, um, working with our net front defenseman, Chris Tanev is by far the, he's like 
a savant on the defensive side of the game. Like he sees it and reads it really, really well. And when he, when he has trouble with something or if he doesn't feel right about something, he works on it. So he grabbed me after one practice and he wanted to work on some denying passes from the goal line, but he wanted different options put in there. So sometimes it's, it's as simple as having a, a coach and a player on the goal line, for example, and you're working on your defenseman that's at that dot or where his stick should be and denying a pass to try to knock that down or not let it through. And then as you get progressing with that, you can add variables to it. So different people, different options. So he has to check his shoulders. He has to know where his stick is going to move to, where that pass is going to go. And you can do the same thing with forwards. Like certain teams, um, you can make little two-on-one games up top where it's it's one penalty kill forward versus a defenseman and another forward that's basically D-man walking to the middle and a forward's high on that flank. And he's trying to deny passes from one, getting from the flank back up to that defenseman. His job is to make sure he cuts that off. Um, other teams kill differently than what we do for sure. But there's all sorts of little drills that you can break down with your players to, to work on the habits. And then you use your video, I think, if you have that um, ability to reinforce what you want to see um, done. So little denying the pass drills for your defenseman from below yeah. the goal line to the net front are unreal. It's... Uh, it's something that's a hard skill for them to learn how to do. But if you continue to work on it all the time, different areas, different passes, it's amazing how how much better they get at it. And sometimes, as you said, they don't want to work on it. They'd rather be the guy on the blue line totally, walking yeah. and shooting or working the power play stuff. But um, you do see some improvements when you, you use some repetition in those type of drills. So it's breaking down a skill that you think is important uh, and then trying to find a, a way you can put it into a, design a little drill for it and practice and it doesn't have to be a real fancy thing at all it could be something that hey we're not very good at stopping this pass well make a little drill about that and that's what it kind of comes down to but getting them together is the hard part and if you can find a way to use four penalty killers together that are actually penalty killers that allows them to work together for the first few times i think is important too um you mentioned sort of those hard skills and you mentioned Chris Tanev and, and part, part of this is just a bit of a selfish question because I know like just don't a bunch of the coaches that had him here in Vancouver, like just seemed like one of those players, like everybody had such a high level of respect for him as a person, how he approached his, his craft. Um, and just seems like somebody that's made a living out of the hard skills and just leaning in, Ugh. really leaning into those. Can you, in, any comments? Cause I, I, I know his story to the NHL is incredibly unique. If, if I, my understanding is like he didn't play hockey for a year because he was too light, like he was too slight when he was 15 or 16. And I know it's a story where I've pointed a lot of players where they're like, Hey, like I'm all the doors are closed. I'm not going to, it's like, no, like you got to take, you're still in the driver's seat and you have a great player to look at, but can you maybe just sort of speak to your yeah. experience coaching him and what, what makes him tick and maybe what could be passed on to from coaches to other players? Well, you know what the awesome part of, about him was? He used to be an offensive defenseman. So there is times when he first came to us, and I'd watch him in practice or watch him beforehand. I'm like, this guy's got good skill set. Like, we were yeah. thinking of this guy as a defensive defenseman, and I watch him do things. So then I went up to him and asked him um, about, geez, it, it looks like you're you're pretty good on the offensive side of the game. He said, I used to be an offensive defenseman. And then he said, as he got older and when he was trying to break into the Canucks system, um, he realized that that wasn't an opportunity for him. So he changed the way he played his game no to allow him to play in the NHL. Um, and he's turned it into an amazing career. Now, he is a real student of the game too. Like when we do our video sessions, he's like into it and he's dialed in and he knows what's going on. So he prepares really well. Um, but as I mentioned, with if there's something that he has to work on, he spends time on it. And then he gets to the point where, okay, now I know where shot lanes are. I know where I have to put my body in order to make sure I'm in this shot lane. Or um, I know how to get under this stick now or, or change my feet to make sure this is the right position. But what I love about him now is he knows who he is. Um, if we have a defenseman that's struggling, we put him with Chris. And Chris settles yeah. him down and helps him find his game again. And I think that's the ultimate compliment for him that um, I don't know if there is a player that's played with them who hasn't had, whether it's all season or, you know, 10 games in a row, their best stretch of hockey. Cause he just finds a way to settle everybody down. Um, 
and it's it's not necessarily being overly vocal but he's in the right spot at the right time he takes a lot of pride in his details and he makes his partners feel comfortable that they can play their game and he's going to take care of things around them and he's he's such a good person for our guys to watch and learn from that um, we're fortunate and lucky to have him uh for sure. And even there's times with he's a right-handed defenseman and I'm trying to get left-handed defenseman to watch him in regards to this is how you block a shot, but turn your head around and think about yeah. doing it on your side of the ice. Um, Cause he just, he's got a way about him that he's, he's figured it out, but he had to learn how to do that. And that's the, maybe the, the best thing about Chris is that he's, he's found a way to be a great defenseman um, by working on his game, working on his craft and, and really taking pride in what he does. And as I said, I've, there's not many guys on the defensive side of the game that make the reads he does like he just sure. he sees it like an offensive guy sees the openings on the ice he sees it that way defensively which is pretty cool coaches ask me all the time how they can get more accomplished during their practice my answer huddle here's why because the more you can teach and educate off the ice the more progress you can make on the ice Huddle is the leading video and data solution for ice hockey in the world. Huddle delivers simple yet powerful video review tools with desktop and mobile apps, enabling entire teams to review, study, and share video anywhere and at any time. Plus, with Huddle Assist, you can quickly get access to a full suite of game stats along with your film breakdown, so you can analyze both your team's and individual player performance, ensuring you provide objective feedback. Right now, listeners of the Glassnote podcast can get a great discount on Huddle products. To learn more, check out huddle.com forward slash the coaches site for details on this exclusive offer. That's H-U-D-L dot com forward slash the coaches site. 